And my name is Juwan Parrish. I am with Jason Fenwick. Today's date is November 8th. It's Friday. I am in Gainesville, Florida. Mr. Fenwick is in Washington, D.C., correct? Yeah, um, suburban Maryland, but yes. Okay. Right outside Washington, D.C. Okay. Can you state your full name for us? My full name is Jason Wyeth Joseph Fenwick. And when and where were you born? I was born in the heart of the South, Nashville, Tennessee, on September 25th, 1967. And what are your parents' names? My father's name is Dr. Joseph Wyeth Fenwick III, and my mother's name is Glenda Fay Ward Fenwick. And do you have any siblings? Is it just you or? <laughs> I wish. I'm the fourth of five children, so I'm, I'm the second to last. Okay. Four, well, boys, what are, four boys, one girl. And what are their names and ages? My oldest brother is Russell Craig Fenwick. He was born in 1957. My sister, Leslie Teresa Fenwick, was born in 1961. My brother, John Robert Fenwick, was born in 1963. And my younger brother, Justin Ward Fenwick, was born in 1970. And were they all born in Nashville too? Nope. They, um, my older two siblings were born in Washington, D.C., which is where my father's from. And my uh, immediately older brother was born in Kansas City, Kansas, which is where my mother's from. And my younger brother was born in Toledo, Ohio, which is where we were living at. So would you, where would you say you spent most of your childhood at? We spent most of our childhood in Ohio, uh, but the irony of it was my mother's from the heartland, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma. My father's from Washington, D.C. And although we were in a northern city, everyone that entered our house was from the south. My father had gone to uh, Meharry Medical School. From Harry Dental School, actually, which is in Nashville, Tennessee. And he and a group of friends moved north because back then what would happen is everything was segregated. And so uh, African Americans went to African American doctors, lawyers, etc. And so if a doctor was retiring somewhere, there were only two medical schools that the majority of the African-American doctors and dentists came out of, and that was Howard University in Washington, D.C., uh, and Meharry Medical School, which was in, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. So they would call the schools and say, hey, we need an OBGYN, we need an eye doctor, we need a dentist, we need an oral surgeon, whatever. And the school would take their graduating class and send them up to those cities and they would have a built-in practice. So they would come in and take over for a retiring African-American physician, dentist, oral surgeon, whatever. Okay, and, the, and they asked your dad to move to, did you say Ohio? So he moved to Ohio. And so he and a, he and a bunch of his classmates moved up there. Um, he originally did his residency in oral surgery in New York. So I've lived in, I was born in Nashville. I lived in uh, right outside New York in Cornwall and for New York City where he uh, interned and did his residency in the city and then he moved to Ohio. We were only supposed to be there a year but he got there and invested time, energy, money and uh, they've been there ever since. But the interesting part to answer your question is uh, everyone who came in our house was from the south. They were either from the south or the heartland or DC so even though I was in a northern city I was always surrounded by Southern ways, I guess, is, is uh, how I'd say it. So when you say everybody in your house, do you mean your, your parents and your siblings or? No, I mean anyone who visited us. Okay. So if you, if we did, I can't recall a large number of people who were from 
Ohio visiting and coming in like for a party or a, for, you know, a Thanksgiving, any, any event. It was always, all, all of our friends, all my parents' friends were from the South is where I'm going with this. Okay. So if they had a party, a barbecue or whatever, everyone who came over, very few people were from Ohio is what I'm saying. So even though you're in the north, you still got a kind of a southern, a southern feel. I always say I, I'm a son of the south, as my father would say. <laughs> On the first day, God created the south and all that is good. Everything else he made from scraps, remnants, and leftovers. They used to say. <laughs> so except, except where, Iowa, where you're from. <laughs> <laughs> hey, leave Iowa out of it. Where? Where are your grandparents from? My grandparents, uh, uh, my on my father's side, Washington D.C. My father is a Washingtonian and a native Washingtonian, going back you know, hundred years, hundred plus years. Um, my mother, on my mother's side, my grandfather was born in uh, 1894. My grandfather was born in 1894. My grandmother was born in 1908. They are from, my grandmother was from Arkansas and my grandfather was from Oklahoma on my mother's side. On my father's side, Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. So do you know the story of how your, your mother ended up in Kansas? In Kansas? Or, or in, is she, yes, you, they, uh, they migrated, they migrated my, uh, Grandfather served in World War One, and uh, my grandmother was one of the original uh, WACs, which was Women's Auxiliary of the Army Corps, which is the very first women to be admitted into the Army as either officers or in any capacity. She was a nurse, like a, a nurse. Um, they ended up migrating to uh, Kansas City, you know, for jobs to move from the country into the city. Uh, but my, originally they were in Oklahoma. My mother was born in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, which was, uh, ironically outside of Tulsa near, uh, Black Wall Street. They had a, they had an area of Oklahoma they used to call Black Wall Street where well-to-do African-Americans who owned their own businesses and everything lived in this particular area. Okay. So your mother was born in Oklahoma? My mother was born in Oklahoma. She met my father because she and her three sisters, my grandmother, uh, sent them all to Howard University. My father attended Howard University. For undergrad? Yes. So they met in, your parents met in undergrad at they Howard? Met, they met in undergrad. My father was driving a blue convertible Thunderbird and my mother was wearing a pink dress with a pink bow. And apparently that's what caught my father's attention and he offered her a ride to her class. And he would always say, if it weren't for that pink, darn pink bow, uh, who knows what would happen. And do you know you, you, their majors while they're at Howard? My mother was nursing and my father was uh, biology, I believe, because he became a science teacher right after education and, and, and biology, if I recall correctly. He became a science teacher for a few years before he went to dental school. So was your, uh, what was your father's occupation? Was he a dentist? He was a dentist by trade, but he, he went into uh, construction. So in the early 70s, uh, most doctors in the 50s and 60s were, in the 50s, they were in their houses, practicing out of their houses. 60s, they were more on Main Street, like, you know, walk down Main Street, there's a hardware store, a pharmacy, and a doctor's office. In the early 70s, a new concept came, which was these multi-story uh, buildings right next to hospitals, which you now go into today, you, where you go into one building and there are 50 doctors, that was brand new back then. So he got into building those. He also was a health commissioner. 
And what was your, your mother's occupation? My mother was a nurse by trade, but homemaker. Meaning she was, she, my mother has four degrees. She has two bachelors and two masters. My father has a bachelor's, a master's in public health, and obviously his doctorate degree in, in dentistry and oral surgery. And my grandmother they... was president of her college class, which was rare for her age. She was born in 1909 and was president of her class. So it was rare for a woman to go to college in the 1920s and 30s, let alone be president of the class, et cetera. <clears throat> and where did your gr grandmother attend? Langston University, out in the heartland. Can you say that Lang one more time? Langston University, like Langston, Langston Hughes. And your mother has four degrees. Did she get them all at Howard? No, she got uh, one at Howard. Ooh, I'd have to go back and ask her, to be honest. <laughs> That's one of those little small details. I know she has them. Um, I don't remember all the, the when and the time and all of that, but I, uh, she started Howard, got one there. Um, I know she got one when, one when I was in high school. I think her last one when I was in high school. So she would always just go back to school to, not necessarily for employment reasons, but just simply she found something interesting. All of my aunts, uh, or strong women, well-educated women. Uh, that was kind of a family thing that uh, that that the women would be well-educated. That's that sounds really bad. I know, just saying it, but that's, that's that was a good thing. But that was a that was a one of the family things. That's fair. Do you have anything else you would like to say about your grandparents? Um, my grandmother was widowed. As I said, my grandfather served in World War II. My grandmother was widowed. And at the time, women could, she had to go to the church to get the uh, priest, the pastor of, we were Catholic, to come to court to sign certain documents because women couldn't sign certain documents as it related to property and, and uh, legal documents. So, um, my grandparents really set the standard for the family or continued the standard that they had inherited, um, which was, you know, you serve the community, you take care of your family, you take care of your children, you know, you try and mark as many things as you can with excellence. And so uh, there was that period of time where she carried the family literally on her shoulders. Uh, you know, because she was she was widowed with four young children. So my mother, who's the youngest, was four months old when she was widowed, and so she had to raise four children uh, in the Great Depression, <laughs> uh, like a great like you know in the heartland, and you know take care of business in a time and place where women couldn't take care of business. So literally, she had to go to get the pastor of the church to come to court as a man and vouch and sign certain documents, although that man had no interest in the property or anything else. But she needed a man to do that. That was, right. that was uh, who it was. And this is your mom's mom. Was this, is my, this is my mother's mother. Um, my grandfather, my grandparents on my father's side uh, owned businesses. So we've always owned businesses. They owned, uh, as did my mother's side. Uh, uh, they owned hotels, apartment buildings, pool hall, a restaurant, and rental property in Washington, D.C. On my mother's side, uh, ironically, the they had a large ranch, but they also uh, owned a bank. So owned one of the, the largest black bank um, east of the Mississippi, Douglas Douglas National. I'm sorry, Douglas State Bank. 
So both sides were business owners, both sides of your grandparents? Yes, ma'am. And are you able to list your, your parents' siblings? Yes. Like uh, on my mother's side, my mother's brother is Irving Ward. He's passed. Uh, my uh, aunt, my aunt Alice, uh, aunt Alice Ward Russell, uh, she's passed. Uh, most recently, uh, my uh, aunt Betty, Betty Jane, Tal Betty Jane Ward Taliaferro. She just passed uh, a couple months ago. So my mother is the only remaining person in her family, her original nucleus family to be alive. Um, my father's brother, Vernon, uh, has passed. And I'm drawing a blank on my father's other, on my, my, other my other uncle, who's also passed. He's been passed for a long time. But I'm sorry, just for that minute, I drew a blank. Um, um, I'm trying to think. My father's the only living person from his. They're both the only original per people. So my father's 80, 88, and my mother is 84. They're the sole, each is, each is a sole survivor of their original nucleus family. Wow, I just realized. I mean, I always I knew it, but until I just said it like that, that kind of, you know, hits me. Right. So, do you have anything else you would like to share about your parents? Um, my parents greatly affected uh, everything about us. You know, our entire upbringing. Uh, I had a great childhood. It was a very loving environment. Uh, we grew up in a large house. Uh, uh, ironically, we grew up in a uh, all-white neighborhood that had deed restrictions on it, but everyone who came in our house was looked like me or you. I was African American, but we uh, it was very protected, very organized, very uh, very structured. I guess it was it was what was then a traditional home. Uh, my father went to work. My mother was at home. Uh, uh, ironically, some parts of my uh, childhoods are odd now. When I got out in the world, I didn't realize it. So as an example, because my father controlled his own schedule, we usually ate lunch with him three times a week. So the school would release us. We would walk home, sit at the, sit at the table. My mother would cook us all a hot lunch. We would eat lunch with my father, my mother, the, you know, everyone. And then we'd go and walk back up to school three blocks away and finish uh, school. So that was odd then because, you know, most fathers left at 8.30, came back at 5 or whatever. And I didn't realize how odd it was. Um, yeah, my parents were a great influence on, on uh, my life all the way around. Um, they set the standard in terms of expectations, uh, the stories of my grandparents, uncles, everyone else, what they were able to accomplish, you know, gave me a sense of confidence that I could uh, accomplish a similar lifestyle. And I've been fortunate to do just that. So. So you mentioned you would walk back and forth to school to eat lunch with your, with your father and your, your mother. Did and you? Siblings. And siblings, my siblings as well. And siblings. And siblings. Now in, in elementary school, did you, did you go to elementary school in Ohio? I did. Elementary and high school. And was that your main method of transportation to school was, was walking? <laughs> yeah. Well, the school back then it was neighborhood school, so it was only three blocks, one, two, three, four blocks away. So yes, it was my main tra <laughs> of transportation. Uh, it's a little diff. Things are a little different today. And then the high school was across the field, so both my elementary and high school were 
you know, it, it'd be easier. It, it was shorter than walking from, you know, the law school to like, it would be like walking to Lake Alice or something, you know, that's probably a little shorter, but it, it isn't, it isn't a long distance as it relates to like, the, if I walked, it'd be shorter than walking to the stadium, you know, on campus. Yeah. It'd be much shorter than that, about half that distance. Okay. And were your, were you and your siblings close enough in age where you guys would walk together? So yes, we'd all walk there, but the whole neighborhood walked together. So the, all the kids in the school walked to school. Really? <laughs> yes, really. So like you, you, you only got there were no buses. There. I I I never I've never ridden a a school bus. In fact, someone made fun of me in law school because they said uh, we were all having a study group and. Someone made a joke about the cheese wagon, and I, at the end of the joke, I said, well, what, what's a cheese wagon? And they all stopped and looked at me like, what do you mean, what's a cheese wagon? I said, what's a cheese wagon? Like, you've never ridden a school bus? I'm like, no, I've never ridden a school bus. We also went to private school, so that, that could be it. But uh, no, I've never ridden a school bus. Like, that was my other question. So, what you you, you did not attend public school? It was private school throughout your University of Florida is the first private school. University of Florida College of Law is the first private public school I've ever attended. Okay. Now, was was walking to school as a group? Was that was that common, like in the neighborhood, or was it just? Do you think it was just your private school? It was common you know? across the United States. Oh. That was a normal thing across the United, wherever you live, that was normal. Busing didn't start, I don't think, until the early 70s, if I recall correctly or something. But even then, picking kids up, you walked, you walked to school. I walked to basketball practice, football practice, tennis practice. My parents didn't take me. No parent took you a lot. You know, you, you rode your bike or walked. That was just normal. So what would you describe elementary and middle school Jason Fenwick like? I'm enjoying your reaction to this more than probably anything else. Like, you're like, what? Like, did they ride dinosaurs? Like, <laughs> what about the pterodactyl attack? Um, so I, the, the nice thing is, well, there are a couple things that are different. The first is I was one of five children. That was normal that was normal or more. So my neighbors had four children across the street that eight next to them had nine. So having a large group of children were normal for each household. I remember going to a new friend's house that had just moved and it was just him and his sister. And I kind of looked at him and said, is your mom sick? Like where are the rest of you guys? Because having only one or two or three children was abnormal, at least where I, everywhere I went. Everyone had four, five, six, seven children. Um, so every day the kids would go out. In the summertime, your mom would be like, you have to go outside and play. So we played every day outside some sport or whatever. So walking was the norm. Um, school age, I came in, I started grade school, first grade in 1972, uh, which was the very... There was the original integration wave, which was just like a person here or there integrating a school. And then there was kind of like the secondary wave. So me and my siblings kind of came in what I call the secondary wave, where it was more across the country. And so I was usually one of two, maybe one or two black kids, usually two black children in the class. And they separated us. So I have my best friend was a guy named Dwayne Badgett. We were always in the same grade at the same school, but it wasn't until the eighth grade that they put us in a class together. So they would put one black boy in each class and one or two black girls. They would never put us together. Um, so that was one thing. It was the early, you know, I, jo I tell my children who are 17, 19, and 21 now, um, you know, in some ways I was fortunate because I grew up in America where you didn't have to guess what was going on. It was crystal clear. So if someone was fat, 
they were called fat. If they were black, they were called black or a nigger, whatever, or nigger, you know, if they were gay, whatever it was, you didn't have to guess. The society was very rigid, black and white. Um, so a couple things were good. There was obviously a lot of racism, which my parents taught us how to deal with that. Um, coming from a large family, four boys who are good in athletics, um, you know, when I walked to school and I walked home, I didn't have to, I was never outnumbered. I'll put it, you know, I was always outnumbered, but at least I always had, you know, I came with a self-made team around me. Um, uh, so it was an interesting, that was interesting. You know, there are interesting experiences as a kid. I tested off the charts with the IQ. They tested me three times, uh, primarily because, uh, they didn't believe that a black kid could be that smart and they thought I cheated. And so there were a number of times in my elementary school where I'd have to redo test because I scored too high or I scored the highest and they'd ha or they'd have me do it in front of them, like standing and do it orally or something just to see if it was me who answered and I didn't cheat off of something. Um, so that's something, uh, my best friend, Dwayne, who I mentioned, uh, one day, randomly, a teacher knocked on his parents' door and said, you need to get your daughter out of this school and transfer her somewhere else, his, his younger sister. And they were like, why? And he's like, because she's the smartest kid in the class and has been for the last three years. And they're talking now about how they can derail her. Now, this is a woman who's never taught his, his sister. She had taught me and Dwayne, me and Dwayne uh, or she had taught, I forget which, which one, but... Um, so there were good hearted people who would act out against the system, but the system was oppressive. So you had to learn to navigate the system uh, at an early age. And I was fortunate to have parents who uh, were very good at that. You, you said they were, they were wanting to derail her. What, what do you mean by that? <laughs> wow, this is, this is great. Um, derail her means break her spirit, uh, convince, you know, when you're the smart kid, you're not a threat when you're the dumb kid, you're a threat all throughout my career. There've always been things where they would derail or send you down a path that was a dead end, uh, or limit what your exposure was. Uh, so they, they, they were planning it in advance. And this woman came and told them that they're planning. And she was only in like the second or third grade. So it wasn't like she was, you know, winning valedictorian in the scholar at, at law school. But that was common back then. That was not something that was abnormal. There are all these different programs that would derail black excellence. Can you elaborate on how your parents taught you to deal with racism? Like just by examples or anything you could remember like growing up? So I'm, I'm laughing because uh, my children grew up in the age of Obama, you know, where uh, there were women secretary of states, women national security advisors, Condoleezza Rice, President Obama, you know, like you would see. So you'd have to understand the era I grew up in. If you were watching TV, and this is the late 70s, so I was like 10, 11, 12, and you were watching a Coca-Cola commercial, and there was like a scene from like kids in high school. And if there was one black person in the sixth row of like the stands of a football game, you would literally pick up the phone and call your friends. Parents wouldn't be like, hey, turn it to channel four, NBC. Yeah, the Coca-Cola commercial. See the black guy in all the way in the back? There's one. That's the only commercial. We do that because it was the only commercial. Um, when I bought my mother a Mother's Day card, we would take a pencil or my father and color it in because it'd be, it'd be a white person. So we would color in the faces. That was up until I was well into high school. Um, so now when you go to the store to buy your mother, your girlfriend, your father a card, it has a picture of someone who, who looks like you. You can find that. There weren't any dolls. When my sister bought, we had the special order dolls that looked like, you know, they were black. And when my sister would walk around, people would kind of stare at the doll. Like, where'd you get that? Why would you want a doll that was black? 
despite the fact that we're black. Um, you know, um, so you have to understand the backdrop. If someone called me, if someone said, let me put it this way. When I watched the news, there's a guy at late night news who was sitting with a thing of whiskey and smoking a cigarette on TV. Like, Hey, I'm here to deliver. This just happened. You know what I'm saying? Like it was just, a, it was another world. If they wanted, there was, there was no, no one was getting fired for calling someone a nigger. No one was getting fired for harassing a woman. No one was getting fired for any, you could say it openly. So they did say it openly, like nigger, get out of here. You know, that, that wasn't, that wasn't abnormal. So there, there was a system in our entire black community, not just where I live, but across the country that prepared our children to deal with it because we had to deal with it from a very young age. So there was no, there really wasn't any protection. So parents just prepared you for it. Now, do you remember any stories that your parents have told you about times they had to deal with um, racism? You don't, yeah, you don't have enough time. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, uh, that's like one. all the time. Uh, let's start with, uh, my father was driving, he was bringing a, he was, he, he, in the summertime, my father was a porter when he was younger. So guys that would ride the railroad from coast to coast. And he did that for a short period of time for, in college where you would serve people drinks. So people would get dressed up to go on the train and, you know, they had black men who would serve them their drinks or whatever. Uh, so you had that, um, uh, but he was coming back from to DC and his car broke down in the middle of a Kentucky town and nobody helped him. Uh, it was just one of those, it was a very, you could get, just coming from Chicago, from different places, Chicago to DC are different places, you could be killed if you were in different parts of town, in different towns. They had sunset laws, which meant you can't be in this town beyond the, if the sun is set, they would literally kill you if you were black. Miami Beach was that way. You could, the help could come onto Miami Beach during the day to work in the houses, but the minute the sun set, they had to be off the island and they would beat you or do things like that. Um, my great grandfather, when the Klan would ride, uh, you know, they would ride up and when in Oklahoma, my great grandfather was like, Hey, um, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die at least standing like a man. So we were always good shots. So he would shoot at a distance. So they didn't ride too often, uh, up on their property. Uh, because, but you could literally be, you know, burned out of your house. Um, the deed to my parents' house says don't, sell this to Negroes or Jews. They had to buy it originally in a trust. Um, well, I mean, I could just keep, no, we've had family members that were die, die because of the Klan, you know, riding. Um, my uncle was one of the first people in Baltimore. He was a surgeon to sue in 1958 or 59 or on the Fair Housing Act because uh, he sent in an application, you know, he's a surgeon, he's moving to this area, he's going to be working at this hospital, and they accepted his application to rent an apartment or a house, it was a house. Then when he arrived, and obviously he was black, that was like, no. Um, very few schools admitted you. The University of Florida wouldn't have admitted my father, regardless of the fact that uh, he was well qualified, just simply because he was black. Virgil Hawkins is the one who opened the door there. Um, I mean, the list, I don't even need to go into the racist stuff that's happened to my parents. I could just talk about the stuff in my own life that, you know, right. fill the next 12 hours. Oh, no, you're good, man. That's, that's so, right. perfect. Which brings me to one of your questions, which was, uh, did I want to be a lawyer as a child? The I, I never thought I was going to be a doctor. Uh, but when I was a kid, Bobby Dean down the street, who was my friend. Uh, that was an interesting thing about uh, blacks and whites where they played together. 
it was fine until a certain age. And then when that certain age occurred, they needed to separate, you know, separate the friendship. So we were, we were three blocks, four blocks away. And, uh, we were playing together. Uh, uh, but we went to school one day and I don't even know, I don't remember all that happened. It was, you know, just kids playing, maybe football or whatever. And somehow there was an argument about a play and he called me a name. I called him a name uh, like punk or something. Or, you know, I know I call whatever sissy. You don't even know what sissy means, but yeah, you know, but you know, that means back then that meant, oh, you're gay or something, you know. And so he called me nigger. I had never heard the word nigger. I was five years old. And, uh, but everyone stopped, everything stopped. And, uh, you know, I, I knew something had occurred. I just didn't know what. And so I called him the biggest word I could think of, which was punk. That was the word my, my mother was like, you can't use that word. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna use this word. So I went home and asked my mother what it meant. And, uh, cause I, like I said, I didn't know what the word meant. And so she explained it to me. And when she said, well, it's the word they use to describe black people and they use it to mean that you're dumb or ignorant. I remember thinking, well, I'm not, I'm the smartest kid in the class. I, you know, I've just scored off the charts on the IQ exam. Um, so I didn't understand what it meant or why they were calling me it. And so my mother explained it to me, the history of it. And then I remember this because I asked her, I said, has anyone ever called you nigger? And so I remember the look in her eyes when she had to admit to me, yes, that, you know, these things had occurred. So I said, okay, I got you. And so the next day, whatever it was that triggered the first thing incident, whatever the play was or whatever, I just repeated it. Uh, little Bobby called me nigger. And uh, do you mind closing my door, babe? And... Uh, uh, he pushed me or did something to me. I, whatever it was, I was like, okay. And I popped him in his nose and broke his nose. Uh, so we got called up to the school. Do you mind closing the door, babe? No, there's these two doors. Thank you. Um, we got called up to the school to, uh, uh, they were going to, Ex, you know, either suspend me or expel me. And I remember because my father came up to school, my mother came up to school. When I came home that day, I still had his blood from his nose on my shirt. And my mother asked me what happened. I told her and I waited. I never, I normally I'd come home from school at three something and three o'clock and I change my clothes into play clothes because we had a uniform. And, you know, we go out and play. That day I waited till my father came home because I wanted him to see the blood on my shirt. Uh, when he came home, he got out of the car, he looked at me and said, what happened to you? Thinking I was injured. Where'd the blood come from? Would you cut yourself or this or that? I said, this ain't my blood. And he said, whose blood is it? Thinking, oh, it's one of my brothers or sisters. And I'm like, no, it ain't their blood either. It's Bobby's blood. So I went and told the story. Uh, this, I had the note from the school. Anyway, long story short, we go back up to the school. Uh, there's my parents, Sister Mary Thomasina, whoever my teacher was, so she was the principal, and the other parents, Dr. Dean and his wife. So Bobby comes in with a taped up nose. My father comes in, they're ready to expel me. Uh, my father comes in, when everyone sits down, he says, you know what? I don't think little Bobby should be expelled. Now, no one was there to expel Bobby for calling me nigger. They were there to expel me. He was the one who pushed me or hit me first. So I was like, oh, so I, I, even I looked at my dad like, oh, maybe he's mistaken. Said, I, we're, he said, uh, uh, I don't think we should expel little Bobby. And so Dr. Dean said, what do you mean expel little Bobby? For what? Getting his nose broken? And my father turned and said, no, for repeating what he hears in his house out in the streets because it might offend someone. And he said it very calm, just like that. And Dr. Dean and Mrs. Dean leaned back and said, well, what makes you think he heard it at our house? And my father then turned and looked at the principal and said, I just presume that unless, of course, he learned it here at the school. And then looked at the principal, who was like, oh, oh no, we, we would never do that. 
and it was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I think we should just have Jason apologize to Bobby and that be that. And uh, I don't think he should be expelled. And I remember just thinking like, wow, that was just really deftly handled. And so when we got in the car to drive home, I was in the back playing. And my mother uh, uh, was like, wow, you know, said, you should have been a lawyer, Joe, Joe, the way you handled that situation. And that was the first time where I thought in my head, I will look at being a lawyer, you know, like just doing that. The other uh, time was my father would take me to business meetings and I noticed that a lawyer and an accountant were the primary things outside of the family that we went to people for and prefer professional services in terms of building the building and things like that and business. And so that's where I made a decision to get a degree in finance and accounting, and, which I have, and a degree in law. Perfect. And can you uh, segue into the process leading up to law school? Did you, uh, in undergrad, did you go into undergrad with the expectation that you're going to go to law school afterwards? I went into law school with the expectation that I would be a surgeon and that I would then go maybe to law school and start buying companies and go into business. When I was little, again, it goes back to a different era in America, my father literally went down the line and said, you're gonna be a professor to my sister, you're gonna be a surgeon, Jason, you're gonna be a dentist, you're gonna be a pharmacist, and I forgot what the last one was. So he had told me I was gonna be a surgeon because I scored well, and so I thought I was going to be a surgeon, but I only wanted to be a surgeon to make the money so I could then buy businesses. And I said, well, if I go into law school, I could do that. Uh, about my sophomore year, I took whatever, morphology or something like that. And I said, ooh, we're not, I'm not going to be a surgeon. So I switched my major to finance because um, that's what I always wanted to do. So I always say I'm not a lawyer. I'm a finance, I'm a business guy with a law degree, which is different than being a, a lawyer in my mind. Um, and so... Uh, I mapped out what I wanted to do. So I looked at the skill sets that I needed to be successful. And so when I graduated, uh, I started as a financial analyst at Johnson & Johnson in their headquarters supporting sales and marketing. But I always planned to somehow get into sales and marketing so I could, uh, which would force me to uh, do presentations. And because I knew if I went into law or business, I needed to have presentation skills. And so going into either of those areas would force me daily to do presentations all the time. So I would be very good at it, which it did. Um, uh, I went into sales. So I started as a financial analyst in Johnson & Johnson supporting sales and marketing. Then I switched to sales because all businesses, no matter what the business is, has a sales function and sales is the most important thing in the business, uh, at least initially. Um, so I wanted to have that skill set. Um, so I tried to do four of the five disciplines, which I was fortunate enough to do finance, operations, sales, marketing, and I'm probably missing one, but, uh, so I, that was my plan. So I worked five years before I went to law school, which was part of my plan. And then at 25, I went to, I think I started law school at 25 or 20, 26. And where did you do your undergrad at? Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia. Another historically black college. And did you did you make that decision based off of your parents attending an HBCU or, or? at the time, no. Um, at the time they didn't call them HBCUs. They were just the only colleges blacks, you know, so Black people, my parents' age, they don't call it HBCU because there was no, they couldn't go to, if you were in Florida, you went to FAMU, you couldn't go to Florida State or Florida. So there wasn't a designation. It's just the only place, you know, one of the, you could go. One or two people went here or there, you know, like a Florida or something, but not the masses. That came about, that designation came about like in the 
early 90s, late 80s, something like late, I think 90s, mid 90s, where now they had to classify them. Um, I didn't go. I was originally, my sister went to UV at University of Virginia. And so I was looking at Virginia. Um, my dad wanted me to go to West Point or Annapolis, uh, the Naval Academy. And uh, I was planning to go to Virginia. My father just offered me he said, hey, do you want to go visit your brother who was going to Hampton, my old, immediately older brother and my cousin? And he goes, you want to go visit for spring break? And so if he had said, do you want to go to the moon for spring break? I'd have been like, what, I can get out of here? You mean by myself? He's like, yeah. Uh, so I went down there and once I hit Hampton, I mean, there, there are very few places, Miami, I lived in Miami before I moved to Maryland. Very few places have that many beautiful women that's literally right on the water. Like right, when I say I could, when I opened my dorm window, I could throw a rock just like this, not even using my arm, just use my wrist and hit the water. It was right there on the Chesapeake Bay, the entire campus, beautiful campus, beautiful location. Um, it was a great experience. Uh, I recommend that highly. But so I, I it was that week and I think my father, in hindsight, knew that it'd probably be better that I go there. But it was that week that uh, I made a decision. Like, after day one, I was like, okay, this is where I'm going to school. And that's where I went. And when, what year did you uh, start at Hampton? 1985. What were you doing in 1980? What, what year were you born? <laughs> I was born in 1994. Oh, okay. Well, at least you're in the 90s. I thought maybe you... Right. You were this, I thought you were the other side of the century. So nope, nope. every blue moon I'll state when I went to school or when I was born and the person will look at me like, that was last century. I'm like, no, no, no. that was last century. Yes, you're correct. So, <laughs> And uh, can you speak to what your experience at Hampton was like? It was great. Since it was, it was the first time in my life that I didn't have to carry the weight of race. My entire life, I've always, you know, always had to be cognizant of race. When I was eight years old, walking home from uh, a store three blocks away, the police pulled up and we used to call it the Silver Flash. They got out of their car and I was eight with a bag. He pulled his weapon on me. He pulled his gun on me, which was common. He said, hey, uh, we used to call it the Silver Flash because there was no talking. They'd get out and pull the weapon. So before they said hello, it was pull the weapon. Um, so all the stuff you see on, you know, on the, the FaceTime or, you know, if they're videotaping, we just didn't have telephones uh, to videotape anything. But we knew it was happening. Um, and so what are you doing? What are you doing, boy? What are you doing, nigga? I'm like, I'm walking home. Like, where do you live? What are you doing on this side of town? I'm like, oh, I live like, a block away. What's your address? Well, this is my address. What do you got in the bag? Milk. I, you know, I pull up. My mother sent me to the store to get milk. He said, did you steal it? And that's when I learned why my mother, there were all these, you said, did they prepare us? There are all these little things they told us to do, but we didn't really understand why. So one of the things that I still do to this day, um, I, I kind of slowed down like two years ago because I realized, oh, I don't have to do it anymore is anywhere I go, if I get a receipt, I keep it till the end of the day or the next day. So if the police pull me over and say, did you steal this? I didn't know it until that day. My mother's like, that's why I told you I always have a receipt. So when he said, did you steal this? It was in a bag with the name of the store on the bag. The store's two blocks away. Did you steal it? I pulled the receipt out. He came over, looked at the receipt, said, go on. I'll be watching you. I was like, okay. To this day, I'm 52. Until a couple of years ago, I still collected all my receipts because if someone needed to ask me where I was at what time, I got a receipt here. At 12.08, I bought my lunch at Subway. Here's the receipt. At 1.45, I bought some Kleenex or gas at the gas station. Here's a receipt at whatever time. So I would do that on a daily basis, just subconsciously. So there are all these little things uh, that were taught. We would never have walked out of our house with our pants hanging off our 
but like you know the younger day so the way i dress the way i speak all of this was a shield to protect us from racism um i tell my children who, who don't have a, a a point of reference to it but you know i've i've had the police aim a gun at me three times uh, twice oh, i'm sorry once on my on our property <laughs> once a block at eight years old from it and another time i was painting covered in paint they drove by saw me turned around drove back what are you doing i'm like i'm covered in paint i have a paintbrush and a paint can what do you think i'm doing you're like what are you doing you know what i mean like like what are you talking about what we were in, if you were in the wrong side of town or whatever that was normal you know it doesn't really didn't matter what side of town it could just happen um but that was the first time uh you know if i went to a basketball or football game um there was a high chance that i would we would, someone would say something or they would there would always be a crowd or something where you'd have to fight you know, or you'd have to have words not that i started anything it would just be walking hey nigger where you think you're going like uh you know whatever you know so if i played a sport you know if you were winning the crowd you know you, you, i remember one basketball game i wasn't playing but another it was a wasn't jv was senior varsity uh they were dominating we had a black player and they they were there was a song that they changed the word to be like monkey monkey shock the monk something like that so anyway the entire stadium you know started adults every adults children everyone um you know we just had to do it you know we just had to deal with it um so there were all these little things that we were taught so going to hampton was the first time in my life that i wasn't black i was just jason everyone I saw from the janitor to the president was looked like me. And it's the first time that's ever, that that had ever occurred. So for four years, I could go into a situation where I didn't have to carry my sword and my, you know, my sword and my shield mentally. I could just relax, just be me, have a normal conversation with you or this person. And unless I left campus, which back then you didn't leave because not a lot of people had cars. It, you know, you were just in this bubble where it was a normal world. I felt, I knew what it felt at that point to be white in America, where everywhere you go, people just accept you. Or if, if they didn't like me, it was not because of my, they just didn't like me. Or if they did like, you know what I mean? Like everything was, it was an even playing field. I'd never experienced an even playing field. I've always had to, we were taught you have to work three times as hard to get half as much, which was true then and is still true now. Regardless of how it may appear, it's still true now. I um, agree. So uh, when, when our current president was elected, people asked me, well, how do you feel? And I said, well, the Obama era confused me because I never thought I'd see a black president until I was like in my 80s, if then. Trump, I know. That's straight Jim. I, I know Jim Crow. I, that's not a problem. I grew up my entire life dealing with Jim Crow. So he's just trying to bring back Jim Crow and white, white privilege and, you know, white power. That I understand completely because I've lived the majority of my life under that. Um, so, you know, the, that's not confusing me. You know, but for my children, it is because they never, they didn't experience that, you know. They thought the world was different. So, um, but Hampton was great. It was phenomenal. My two daughters currently go there. Um, I have three children. Two of them are girls. My youngest is a boy who's a senior in high school. Um, they got scholarships all over uh, and they decided to go there. My oldest, I was surprised when she went there. No one was more surprised than me that she went there, but. Uh, she chose it. So her class, the majority of the kids didn't want to go to HBCUs. They said, no, we're going to go to, you know, predominantly white institutions. And, uh, but my second daughter's class after the current, after the last election in Trump, mm -hmm. all these kids that got scholarships to Stanford, NYU, wherever, 
suddenly chose the same parents that had sent their kids to NYU, you know, Florida, Chicago, you know, USC, UCLA, Stanford, whatever, were sending the second child to uh, Hamptons or Howard's because they saw what happened at University of Virginia in Charlotte, you know, mm -hmm. with the marching through with the, the people with the Klan and all that, the Ku Klux Klan and white power, you know, and the person dying, they saw all that. So, um, but it was a very safe place. Um, it prepared me very well for not only corporate America, but also law school. Um, uh, it, it, connect, it connected me with people who looked like me who, had, who were achieving things. So I never went into Florida feeling like, oh, I can't compete. Um, you know, it gave me a great education. Uh, gave me a great network, et cetera. Okay, so transitioning to law school, what was your experience like applying to law school and preparing for the LSAT and making your decision to choose University of Florida Law School? Um, I had worked five or six years. So once you got out and you were working, and it, the biggest issue wasn't, it was just the time. So the LSAT, you know, I'm working a full-time job and I'm, you know, putting in extra there. And then, so it's just shifting the mindset to, oh, I got to do this. Oh, and study. Well, I haven't studied out of a book like traditional school at that juncture for, you know, five years at that point. And if you count my senior year of college, I wasn't really studying a whole bunch my senior year of college either. So, you know, it was it had been a while. So I remember just that part just being, uh, you know, just having to sit down with it and kind of go through it again. Um, I actually was planning to go to UCLA out in Los Angeles. Uh, but I went out to visit UCLA to this day. I still love UCLA. Every time I go to Los Angeles, I visit it. Uh, but I got there and I looked around and I said, there's no way I'm going to graduate from this school. Not because it's hard, but because it's next to, it's in Los Angeles and there were just too many distractions. I knew I wasn't ready to go out and have LA sitting next door, the beach sitting next door, all of that Southern California. And so I came back and I was talking to a buddy of mine uh, who was a Florida alumni. And I said, I need to find a UCLA in a small Southern town with no, without the distractions. And he said, had you ever considered Florida? And I hadn't. And he's, uh, uh, I went down and visited for a week and said, okay, this is, this is where I'm going more than likely. So, you know, I fell in love with the sun, the water, you know, the whole thing. So when you got to Florida, was, was this your first time in Florida? Yes. If it wasn't my first time, maybe as a kid, we went down there for, you know, vacation, but I don't recall call going that far south but yes for the short answer is yeah that was my first time in the state of florida and what was your experience like overall at the university of florida i th i thought it was good um you know while we were there that you know there were professors that people considered to be racist that had been there forever um we had a great dean dean raheem reed who was a assistant dean. He's now a chancellor out at UC Irvine or UC Davis, chancellor of the University of California system. But he was an assistant dean and he was African-American and he was just really great about being a support structure. If you had a problem or an issue, you could go to Dean Reed. And uh, if you can interview anybody, I would highly recommend Dean Reed because he didn't go to University of Florida, but as far as the but batches of students that came through, then he's the main reason why a lot of them either stayed or were able to get through because they had a resource they could go to and talk to. And he was the only one. When I started, Professor Nunn had just started, so he was young and maybe had been there a year, maybe two. But if I recall correctly, those were the only two at the time. And then like my third year, they brought in three others or 
you know, something like two others on the entire faculty. Um, so Florida, and at that time, we also had the Virgil Hawkins summer program. So you got a chance to meet a lot of people. Um, uh, then we brought in a large class. So I think there were 32 in my class, or maybe that was class after. We had 20 or 30. There was a, it was a good number of African-American students who, from all walks of life, who, who you know, done well. Um, and what year there was, was that? I started in 94. I was there 94 to 97. Um, but there was still a fair amount of racism in Gainesville. Um, but it wasn't as bad as I remember other places, you know. So for me, I found law school to be an enjoyable experience. It was easier than working in corporate America because I remember the first first week or first month, I kind of was like, let me make sure I understand this. You just need an answer, but it doesn't have to be correct. It just has to sound good and you have good reasoning. Well, that was different from finance where, you know, you have an eight page spreadsheet. It has to be right. And if it's not, that throws all the other calculations off, which was, you know, something I could do, but it was, it, there was some stress related to that, you know, so you had to make sure you're right. Whereas law was like, Wait a minute, I can just give my opinion, support it with case law, and I can, even if I'm wrong, I can still be right in terms of the answer and the way I think. That I found to be a much lower bar. So I personally, because I worked five or six years, found law school to be relatively easy, not stressful. Um, I knew that if I needed a career, I had a career in finance and business. So if this didn't work out, I can go into finance and business. Um, so I knew I had some options. Um, I actually worked my second and third year full time at a venture capital firm because I found I had that much time uh, to do it. And at that time, nobody knew what venture capital firms were. Uh, 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 so it wasn't, it was something new at the time. And so I worked full time my second and third year, not because I needed the money, but because I wanted to learn the skill set. That's one thing I try and teach my kids. I recommend other, anyone, don't go for the degree, figure out the skill set that you need to develop because you could get the degree but never get the skill set. So you could, go through, uh, you could go through law school but never be a good presenter. You could go through law school and never be a good writer. You could go through law school and not be a good analyzer. But if you start saying, I wanna be a good writer, I wanna be a good presenter, I wanna be a good analyzer, now you have skill sets that come with the degree that make you employable. That was another difference. Our parents, in the time that I grew up, you were prepared to go to work at age 18. There was no live with your parents till 34, 36, you know, in the basement or whatever. So that didn't occur. You mentioned the Virgil Hawkins summer program. Can you yep. um, elaborate more on what that was? They don't have it still? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Um, Virgil Hawkins was the first person to apply to the University of Florida's law school. He was qualified and accepted. When he arrived and they saw he was black, they're like, nah, you can't come. So he sued them. And it ended up going up to, I know, the Florida State Supreme Court. And I think it was headed to the United States Supreme Court. Well, the Florida decided, the University of Florida decided to settle with them. And the settlement was this, you can never go to law school. We'll admit a black student to law school. It just won't be you. If I recall correctly, it was George Allen or there were like three of the first George black Allen. law students. But I think it was George Allen who had just got a text saying he died today, which is ironic, um, at 83. But they, he, he fought them for years and they said, well, finally, you know, we'll get rid of this litigation. We will admit blacks, we'll admit one, but it'll never be you. You have to go somewhere. So that goes back to what I told you about that second grade thing where they derail you. You know, you can fight for something and they're like, all right, we're not going to let the fighter in because he may disrupt more, but will admit some other someone else who hopefully won't be as you know have the same fighting spirit that's what i meant when i said in the second remember that i said that the teacher came to my friend's parents and said 
they're planning to derail your daughter and do certain things. Um, yeah. So this is an example of it where uh, he should have been admitted. He fought to be admitted. He won at each step of the phase in order to prevent going another 10 years in litigation. They said, we'll do it. We'll do one. It won't be you. And so they created a program in his name, Virgil Hawkins Fellowship, and they had full rides. So if you went to the summer program, you qualified for a full ride. The summer program was free to go to. It was also kind of a program that made, that they taught you law. They introduced you to law classes, the Socratic method, the structure, writing, research. It was also a method to make sure in their minds that the blacks that they were admitting were at a level that could compete in law school. So if you, if you didn't make it through the program, it was like, oh, well, you know, you, you, you might as well not come to law school. It was like a, three months of law school, like it started early. Um, oh, it looked like you were gonna make a comment. So, uh, and so I, I went to that and uh, it wasn't mandatory, at least it wasn't mandatory for me to go. I, they just told me about it and I said, okay, you know what? It won't hurt to arrive in Gainesville three months early and go to school. Okay, you're, you know, I don't have to pay for anything. I'll go ahead and do it. Um, and so I participated in the program. And as did the majority of my, not all my classmates who were African-American, but uh, the majority of them did. So we, we formed a bond before we entered law school. We learned the campus before we entered law school. We learned Gainesville before we entered law school. And so um, I don't know if when you arrived from Iowa, but I would suspect, you know, you're getting there and you're having to acclimate yourself and then boom, you're starting you know, a professional degree program. And there's a little bit of stress, whereas we didn't have as much stress because we were able to kind of ease into, you know, more. Right. So to clarify, there is still the Virgil Hawkins uh, Fellowship. They still do have that. I'm just not aware of the summer program. That so they may have, I think they, they may have discontinued the summer program, like, the year I graduated, the year after I, I don't remember anyone when I, I, I've mentioned it before and people would look at me like, what's that? You know, like what's going on? But so for a short period of time, it was, it was a program. It was a good program. And a dilemma now is that the Virgil Hawkins fellowship isn't just limited to black people now. It's almost open to anybody. Yes, anybody. I would, I'm going to look at that because that, that's a shame because the whole purpose of naming it after him is to provide opportunity for people who for, if, I think Florida was founded in 18, whatever, 70, something like that, you know, for a hundred years paid taxes, but couldn't participate, couldn't get the benefit of something they've been paying taxes for, for over a century. So whenever anyone says, well, you shouldn't get it based on rate, I'm like, why not? Your, your father, grandfather, who you're a legacy of, they got it based on race. There were no women admitted to Florida. There were no Jews admitted to Florida. There were no Hispanics admitted to Florida. There were no blacks admitted to Florida until after Brown v. Board of Education. And if you don't believe me, go up. It used to be all the, all the classes where they, they had their class pictures and all of them were on you know, on the third floor, you know, throughout the law school going, you could just go and see every class that's ever graduated. Every class was male and white up until after Brown v. Board of Education. Then you'd see a woman here or a black person there or a Hispanic person there or a Jewish person here, you know, that, that didn't happen. In fact, in 19, whatever the nineties, when I was there, they changed the name to Levin School of Law and uh, Levin is Jewish, and there was a whole backlash because they didn't want the, the Flor University of Florida's good old boy school to have a Jewish name on it. There was a huge backlash on that, to which the response was, well, if you donate $20 million or more, we put your name on it. Um, but there was still anti-Semitic, anti-women, anti anti-blacks, gays, whatever. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah, that's just one thing we've noticed this year about the Virgil Hawkins uh, Fellowship, because um, we know people who received it and they're not 
African American, but in the scholarship requirement, originally it said it was for specifically African Americans. So I think that's something we want to propose to. Are they Afro African or Afro Afro Caribbean? You know, or just they're just straight up whatever. Yes. Right. So there and all is the there and all is one of the issues of that's why your generation has to pick up the the uh, the mantle you know, and continue the race from where it was dropped off. Don't let it go backwards. Um, I agree. Can you speak to what was the dynamic of the black people at the law school during your time? We were close because we had to be. You know, you, 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 so you weren't necessarily, I don't know how it is today, but it, you know, I, taught the last four years at University of Florida. So uh, it appears that uh, the study groups are a little bit more mixed. The people interact a little bit more in a mixed capacity, but it was, it was still segregated. And I don't know, you know, you weren't invited to certain things. And so it could, that was part of it. But the other part was maybe we self segregated somewhat, but there wasn't like the open invitation. You, you could have, you had white friends, but I, it was kind of like church. On Sunday, you can still be friends with someone, but boom, you go to two separate churches and everyone in that church looks alike. Um, uh, so we got along, you know, I, I believe very well, you know, in terms of the, my African-American classmates. Uh, I don't, I'm looking at your thing. There was a lot of unity and solidarity. Um, there wasn't much division. You know, here and there, someone may not like each other, but for the most part, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't the case. We all knew we were in the same boat. So if something happened to you, guess who was going to happen to next? Me. So, you know, we were all fighting the same fight. And then what was that dynamic like between the Black students and the, the, not, the white students? We, my particular class, because the older students would, the older meaning the uh, students who were there, you know, we were one L's, apparently we mixed more with our peers, white and black, than they did, because they would comment on it, like we would go to happy hours or go to clubs, you know, hang out, um, they would comment on it, so it was fine. What were there underlying race? Pro I mean, the, in, in all of America, there were underlying race problems. Did I find the University of Florida to be, um, you know, overwhelmingly racist or anything like that? No, but that didn't mean that there weren't racial incidences. That doesn't mean there weren't racial or racist professors or racist uh, administrators. It just meant that my every single day was not marred by it. Um, but it was still a consideration that I had to consider and that my friends and peers had to consider. And what would you say the, the dynamic between uh, the black students and the black professors were like, was like, I know you said the there's only- in the, I didn't hear the second one, the black students. The black and, pro professors. <laughs> since there weren't that many, you know, it was like one or two, they had to be, they had to get along. You got to remember when you're only one of like one or two or, one of a small group, you, you can't like piss off the one guy that looks like you. So, uh, you know, it, it was very tight that, you know, now I was a, I was a student looking at it from an adult, looking at adults. So, you know, obviously there's that break, even though I was, even though to be honest, there wasn't as big an age difference between us because I had started different, but I was still a student and viewed them as full grown adults having houses, being married, kids, that type thing, you know. Uh, but from the outside of what I could see, they got along very well. They're very tight knit. People took care of each other. Um, uh, so from what I could see, that was the case. And at your time at the University of Florida, who would you say had the biggest impact on you? Whether it was a, a classmate or a professor? That was easy. Dean Raheem Reed. Uh, not even a close second. And the reason being is he took it upon himself. I don't know if it was his job. I think he was Dean of Student Affairs. I don't even remember his title, Assistant Dean of Student Affairs. 
but he took it upon himself to actually, he thought about uh, what our transition would be to a small Southern town. He understood Florida, where it currently was and where, what, where it came from, you know, its history. Uh, he made a point to meet all of us, get to know all of us individually. He had an open door policy, call me, come to me first about any problem. He knew how to navigate the politics and the procedures and administrative processes of the university to get things done. Um, he was just an outstanding individual who contributed, uh, at least during the tenure and three years I was there, um, dramatically to the, the people, the African-American students. That's where I saw a clear example of one person who makes one decision to care and interject themselves and open the door can affect a large group of people on both sides because his presence also validated our presence by how professional he was, how well liked he was, the method and manner in which he communicated orally or written, his thought process, how he lo looked at things. His presence made it easier for people to accept us. His presence and his protecting us made it so that people didn't mess with us. Um, if there was funding that was needed, he understood, you know, what to do and how to make make. He he understood how to uh, uh, move the levers of power and interact with power. I'll put it that way. So that was also. Uh, he was very, he was very good in that regard. And what would you say was your fa your favorite uh, class in, in law school? Or do you have one? I think I got the book award in estates and trust and estate, estates, trust okay. and state planning and trust or something like that. Um, which I don't know where it is, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, but I got, I, 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 that one was easy for me because it was the way I thought, meaning it, it didn't take me any effort to think that way. I understood it from a finance standpoint. I understood it from a law. I understood trust from when I was a kid, things, you know, different things. So you know, that one was easier. My favorite class, I, I don't, uh, my favorite class was the class that ended early, you know, you know, before lunch, you know, where my day was ended at one o'clock or something that day. So I, I, but I didn't have a, that I can remember a favorite class. I enjoyed trial advocacy uh, only because I was competing against my buddy. Uh, he was my partner, but yeah, but I don't remember having a particularly favorite class. What, what uh, extracurriculars were you involved in while you're at the University of Florida, if any? Well, you mentioned trial, uh, trial team. Um, no, no, I wasn't on trial team. There, we had a class. Oh, was, trial, uh, class. Okay. I think it's trial advocacy. I was. Yeah. I didn't. The only I was Balsa's VP. Okay. Um, other than that, nothing. And then, but I worked full time my second and third year. So I worked full time, and I went to school. I went to law school full time. Um, and the, but I didn't. I didn't. I didn't do extracurricular. The big part is, I was very. At that stage in my career, I'd worked five years. I was looking at, okay, if I spend this time doing this, what will it get me when I graduate? Um, so if I didn't see the benefit, I didn't do it. Because my other alternative was to go bike riding, sailing, go have fun. And I was like, you know, I knew this would be the last time I just had a blank slate of time just to have fun. Because I knew I'd be graduating 29, probably get married, have kids, that type thing. Um, so, but I found, uh, this opportunity, like I said, of venture capital and I ran with it. And while you were at in Los, do you know your, the boss of president who they were? I can see their face, but I can't remember their name, unfortunately. Um, do you remember your president, your class president? I can't remember cause she wasn't in my class. She was ahead of me. Oh, okay. Um, God, I don't remember her name. I can see her face, but I can't remember her name. So unfortunately, I apologize now. Okay, from either year, 102 or 30? 
I can't, I okay. don't, I, but the other part was it wasn't, there wasn't a line in front of me to be Balsa VP. I was kind of like, Hey, no one's running. You're running. And I'm like, what? Huh? What? Yeah, you, you, you know, we're going to, we, we just, actually, that's how it came up. They decided I was going to run <laughs> and voted me without telling me, but they would say, look, the board said, we're going to, you know, and then they brought me in and said, we need you to sign this paper and you're running. And I'm like, well, do I get a choice? What do I have to do? Michelle, Michelle was her first name. I don't know her last name because it's changed because she's been married, but I just, it was Michelle was her first name. Um, and I was Balsa VP. I got there in 94, I was Balsa VP in 95. And then, in, I mean, in, yeah, my second year, 2L. And I think my third 3L year, I handed it off to someone because I was working and I was like, hey, unless I do it just in name only, I don't, you know, let's okay. get someone else. That's fair. Transitioning, transitioning into after law school, uh, can you speak to what your, your bar prep experience was? Um, or did you take the bar? Um, and where did you take it? And I, what, was, what was it like? <laughs> uh, my bar prep experience was three months before graduation, I moved to Miami, down to Miami Beach. And in January, I graduated in May. And I got a call, a buddy of mine saying, hey, um, are you still in school? I'm like, yeah. He's like, because the professor is like, you're never here. And he's about to drop you from this class. So I had to drive up to Gainesville to make sure I showed up a few times. Because um, by then, like I said, I had been working. I knew, I was like, hey, I got to know where I'm going. I just have to graduate. That's it. Um, so I graduate. My, and so to this day, I say I should have stayed in Gainesville and did a study group with my friends who stayed in Gainesville, studied and did well. I was in Miami Beach. I would get uh, the tapes from Barbary, which were cassette tapes. So it's a it's the equivalent of you using your i your iPhone, you know, and having a podcast. And I go rollerblading down South Beach, listening to contracts. Uh, contracts, uh, whatever, torts, et cetera. And a buddy of mine called, he said, what you doing? I said, oh man, I've been studying. He goes, man, it's been hard. And so he was telling me how hard it was studying how long the hours were. And I was like, yeah, man, it's, I, I got you. I feel the same way. And he said, what's that music in the background? Like you're playing your radio awful loud. I said, oh no, that's not my radio. He goes, what is it? I go, oh, that's mangoes. I was, he goes, mangoes, like mangoes on ocean drive. I was like, yeah, I was, I was taking a break to get lunch. He goes, I'm sorry, where are you studying? I said, well, I was rollerblading. He goes, rollerblading? What? Huh? What, what are you talking about? Oh, I'm rollerblading listening to the Barbary tapes, and I was stopping to get some lunch, and you called, and he's like, dude, that ain't studying. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so uh, my study experience was uh, – uh, let's just say a, li a little muted, <laughs> you know, in, in that regard. But I paid the price because I missed the bar exam by one point, which if you're going to miss it, that's frustrating as heck. Mm -hmm. So then I'd retake the bar. Um, that's why I took the July bar. And that went in fact, it's, it's July. My oldest daughter was born in September. So I decided that I would skip the November bar and take it in February. Well, back then, I don't know how it is now. Uh, if you miss one part of the test, you don't have to take the whole test. You just take that one part. So in February, I took the, whatever the part was that I missed and, you know, great, passed it. So I'm waiting a few months. I'm like, everyone's talking about they passed. I'm like, great, I passed. I'm waiting for my paperwork, the license. And so I called down there like, hey, you know, did you mail it to my old address? Or I'm waiting for my license. They're like, well, you didn't pass. I'm like, yeah, I did. I, I passed. Like, no, you have to pass in the same cycle. 
what that meant is if you didn't make it in July, you had until November, but you had to do it in November to just take the one part. Otherwise, you had to retake the entire bar. And so they said, you passed all the individual portions of it, but you didn't pass in the same cycle. So you have to take the whole bar again. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, you, th there's no way around. Can I appeal this or whatever? No. Well, my daughter was born. I just, you know, I just didn't know that. Sorry. So by that time I was living up here. Um, and I was like, well, uh, okay, <laughs> we'll figure that one out later. Since I wasn't working as a lawyer, I was working in business. I was like, okay, we'll, We'll eventually get to that. Mm -hmm. Thinking about next year, eventually getting to it. I decided, you know, next year is a year I'll go back <laughs> and just go ahead and get this. So. Okay. So then once you, you know, ran into that hurdle, what, what, you were already working, right? Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. And where, where were you working? Well, I'd started at the time when I first ran into it, when I first didn't pass, I was working at Becker and Polyakoff, which is a large firm in Florida. Uh, they had hired me out of law school. Um, but my fiance was living up here. We had gotten engaged at Christmas. Uh, my kids are going to hear this one day and they're going to say, Dad, you all weren't married when I was uh conceive we were married when we were born but uh we were engaged at christmas she was going to move to miami when she finished her mba and uh we found out we were expecting in january my daughter was born september 4th she was supposed to graduate from uh from her mba like august i don't know 20th or 30th something like that so i had made the decision you know what i can start being married you know, in Florida and miss the pregnancy and all that stuff. Or I can just quit this job and move up to move up to Maryland where she was. She was in the DC area. And that's what I did. So I moved up here, uh, got a job in business and the rest is as they say history. So what it, it didn't affect me. It, it you know it it only affected me in the sense of, oh, you know, I would have liked to have had it just sitting on the wall behind me, but you know, mm. we're still eating all these years later. How's that? That's fair. So did you, did you need help from U.S. alumni at all in getting your job right after um, graduation? Mm -hmm. so like other well, funny, funny story is I got referred to a law firm up here. So I go to there. I didn't ask for it when I first came. Someone said, you should go see this person. I'll recommend you for the job. I was like, uh, okay. So I get up there. I walk in. I'm early. The partner comes in and he walks in. And his first thing he says is, I don't know why I'm even talking to you. And so I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Are you Joe Smith? I thought, you know, yes, I'm Joe Smith. I was like, do we not have an appointment at two o'clock today? Did I, am I on the wrong day or wrong person? Um, I'm supposed to meet a guy about a job here at the firm. He goes, yeah, yeah, I'm the guy. You're in the right spot. I don't know why I'm talking to you because we only hire lawyers from Harvard or Yale. And he said it with a certain way. We only hire attorneys from Harvard or Yale. I just looked at him. I said, okay. I said, which one are you? He didn't know what I meant. because no, I guess no one had ever pushed back on that. I go, which one are you? He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, did you go to Harvard or Yale? And uh, he said, I went to Yale Law School. And I said, oh, that was my second choice, too. I said, Yale was never, I said, I turned Yale down to come here. They were never going to win a national championship. From that point forward, they went on and they ended up offering me the job, but I said, no, thank you. Um, but I actually ended up, no, the, it, was, it was a business contact that was non-Florida related uh, that, uh, that was my first door opening up here. What did help me coming up here was two things. One, the 2000 presidential election was being 
Bush v. Gore, which ended up being a Supreme Court case, uh, was being decided by Florida, in Florida. And so me coming here, having an opinion about it, I suddenly began meeting people and talking to everyone, everyone across the country was talking about it. And so uh, there was this one guy that kept asking me questions like, what do you think? You're from Florida. I said, well, you know, Florida is the wild, wild west. It depends on what, what county it could be come down to who donates $50,000 to a high school football stadium, you know, or the sheriff's, you know, auxiliary fund. So we would just have these conversations. I never knew who he was. I was just at certain receptions talking and like anyone else was talking about it. But he kept inviting me back, kept inviting me back, kept inviting me back. Ends up that particular person ended up being the national chairperson of one of the major political parties. <laughs> and I didn't know, I'm sorry, he became that person, like that he was the next person in line. And he kept calling me in saying, hey, what do you think about what these guys are saying? And I'd be like, has any of these guys in this room ever been off the island of Palm Beach and actually like come on to mainland Florida and interact with people? Because that strategy, I'm not sure that's going to work. So being from Florida helped. Having an understanding of the geography helped in terms of conversation. And then what also helped is we were winning national championships in basketball and football uh, four years you know, two in football, two in basketball. And so, you know, it gave me something. I could wear my Florida shirt or go to a bar, you know, where they're watching the game or whatever. So it, I was able to plug in with alumni and also able to talk to alumni from other schools because, you know, if, if you went to UCLA or Duke or whatever, and we might be playing you in basketball or football or whatever, I had a conversation. It became a conversation piece. The University of Florida. Because... The University of Florida, yes. Sorry about okay. that. Yeah. Okay. And then do you, do you know uh, what the term Gator Nation is? And if so, can you uh, uh, explain, you know, what that means to you or oh, any feelings you have about it? Funny the way you, uh, the way you said that. Um, <laughs> Why? So, yeah, well, you, you're, yeah. It was, I, I believe it was a coin, a term that was coined after I graduated, like a marketing term. We used to say, they, people would say it here and there, but it wasn't prominent. Um, and so there were no hashtags, there was no Instagram, there was no Facebook. There, you know, there wasn't that. They just say it at the games, hey, Gator Nation is, is uh, getting together at the swamp or whatever. Um, so I understand it. For, for me, um, it's not so much the term Gator Nation is the Florida Gators, just being being a Gator, um, Gator Law. So when I was there, we used to have license plate that said Florida Law or Gator Law. Um, so th I have more of an affinity for those. Um, when I first left um, Gainesville, you know, because it was a small town, because there was race, racial incidences and things like that in the University of Florida, there was, in some ways, the farther I've gotten away from it, the more I see how big a benefit and everything it played. But when it was right there, I saw its flaws. Like, wow, this is unfair. That's unfair. We have to work harder with this. What they're doing here is unfair. Um, but it, as I've moved away from it, you know, I, I realized the people I've met were just great people. The opportunities I had were great opportunities the overwhelming majority of the prof professors and administrative staff that I dealt with, uh, you know, I, I don't feel like there was an inherent bias. Where there were bad apples, yes, uh, that's, that's everywhere. Um, but the affinity grew, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, you know, the greater affinity grew from it. So, um, so yeah. And and it also helped that one of my good friends who was a mentor, the one who said, have you ever considered University of Florida? I'm still very good friends with to this day. And so moving up here, he would have been beneficial. Very, He was very beneficial, but he didn't, he's not a law, he didn't go to law school there. He went to undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, so still a Gator. But yeah, I mean, some of my closest friends, uh, you know, people in your wedding, that type thing came from law school.
Okay. And transitioning into now, is there any advice you have for current black law students? Yes. Uh, don't set boundaries on yourself. Try new things. So I, I was a, uh, you know, I, I don't practice law. Uh, I own different businesses. Um, one of them is a business advisory firm. I have a couple other companies, number, well, not a couple, but a number of other companies. Um, I got a 600 person real estate company. Um, I got an investment company where we buy companies or portions thereof, buy and sell companies or do investments. It, how you, there's a difference between what you are, a lawyer, and what you do. So that's why when you asked me earlier in this interview, I said, my father's a dentist by trade. I never saw him being a dentist, but I, he has a degree and a license to be a dentist. What he decided to do is take that and apply his skill sets towards building business, building buildings, re real estate development, public health, and other things, other ventures. I have a law degree, but I don't practice law. I've used it to buy companies, buy, uh, uh, invest in certain things, new developments, work in venture capital. Uh, you know, I teach, I come back and I've taught the last four years, the course on business startups at the university of Florida, it's law school. Uh, so it's, you, you get to define yourself. The degree doesn't define you. And the, for me, the opening came because one day at law school, I decided to go over to the business school and see what types of opportunities they had over there. Cause I had a finance and accounting degree and a business background. And I saw that they had a business fellowship uh, where the venture capital firm hired MBA students and accounting students who were getting their masters to come work for them. And I applied. And they called and said, hey, we got your application. You know, this is for business. I said, well, I have a business background, finance, and this. And so I had to sell them on the idea. I had to say, hey, um, every business deal has some, before you consummate a business deal, it has to go through lawyers. There has to be a contract or things. If it goes back, why not have one on your staff internally that can do the research? And so, um, and so if I had never gone to the business school, never stepped outside of the little box that they said you could do as a lawyer when I was there, um, you know, I guess I'd be a lawyer. Uh, but my, that would have changed my entire life. So you can be anything you want. A law degree complements anything. Uh, my son, who's a high school senior, wants to go into real estate development. Um, he's been working at one of my companies. And so since he was 13. And so I told him, I said, Hey, you know, the number one thing real estate development is he goes real estate. I'm like, no, real estate doesn't matter finance. So go get a finance degree so you can understand the loan terms, the financing and all that and know how to raise money. So, you know, the num number two thing you need to know if you go into real estate development, he's like real estate. I'm like, no, real estate doesn't matter. You need to know the law because you're going to have to deal with contracts. You're going to have to deal with loans, raising money and zoning and reg zoning uh, regulations and legislation and laws. Go get a law degree. And so you can really apply your law degree to anything. Um, and your generation more so than mine was, is being taught that my generation, you were taught, you can be a judge, you can be a lawyer, you can be a politician that was about it um but now the door is open so the biggest advice i would have is um figure out what it is you know you're good at and start looking for opportunities whether it's in law or outside law to earn a living what you're good at where your law degree complements it the second advice i would give people which i wish i had done a better job of but is easier now for you all is twofold. One, I wish I had gotten to know my white colleague. I knew them, but, and they knew me and we were friendly, but we weren't, we weren't friend friends. You know, like I wish I had taken that opportunity. There were a number of good people to really get to know them better and stay in touch with them. So a number of people that I went to school with 
And the same is going to be true with you are going to be your next congressman and going to be the partner at this major law firm, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's, that would be the other advice. And also stay in contact with your uh, BALSA, uh, your BALSA colleagues. We never knew, you know, you never, no one would have ever guessed some of the things, you know, we've done, you know, when I, when, you know, I just came out, we just bought a building, 50,000 square foot building, um, 600 people in it. You, who knew that, who knew I'd, you know, I'd be part of that doing that. Um, who knew I'd teach at law at Florida, you know, I, I don't even practice law, but I, I don't teach, I teach the business course for lawyers. Um, so you never know where people are going to end up. Um, one of my colleagues uh, has a 150 attorney firm. I mean, that was impossible when we were there. I mean, that just, if it was, if it was a white firm, that was huge. But you get what I'm saying? Like the concept of having you own it and you have black people and white people and his, they work for you and you have this giant firm of hundred. That's amazing. I'm still, and she's a woman. That's amazing. Um, there are jobs, judgeships, city attorney. One of my buddies is uh, the number two city attorney at Miami. That was unheard of back when, you know, when I came out. Um, and so they really forged. So I would stay in contact with the people you're in touch with, you know, as students, but I would also as colleagues reach out to people who are ahead of you and, and, and be interested in what they're doing. I know of another one who's a city attorney. That was like I said, Im impossible. Um, so yeah, there are connections. I would do a better job of managing them mm -hmm. I, for myself you got Facebook and LinkedIn and all those things, but I would make it a point to be more, make it personal. So. Okay. What else you got, Iowa? Uh, in closing, it's, it's just two more, two more questions. One is uh, what, what's something important about your job that you would like us to know? It could be anything. And after that, just your closing thoughts. Um, Closing thoughts, um, anything you want to want us to know that we haven't touched on? I graduated from University of Florida at 29. Within three years, I was a millionaire. I worked for myself since I was, I'm 52. I've been working for myself longer than I can remember, maybe. So if I graduated to 01. I think 04, 03, somewhere around there. I've been working the last 15, 20 years. Uh, um, one of the things that I tell to my kids is whatever you do, own it. So when you heard me reference the my friend who I know was started the firm and is a partner, she's not a partner. She's one of the original three who owns the firm. Um, we just bought a 50,000 square foot building which is the size of a Walmart to house our company with six people, we own it. So when my son walks in, just like I walked in my father's buildings and he owned them and he walked in his father's buildings and they owned them. My son, when we did the uh, groundbreaking, we, we owned the company or the building or whatever it is we touch. And that's been an important, I, never, I always knew I'd never practice law. I went to law school so I could read contracts and understand it. And so I could hire an attorney and a friend of mine, Kevin Jones, who went to law school with me for 20 years has told me no, that he would not accept my uh, uh, offer to come work for me. <laughs> but my point is uh, I'm a big believer in, you know, the last place of civil rights is ownership. Um, you know, money, I've seen where money changes how people react to you. It changes the, how the law reacts to you. Uh, whether it's criminal or civil, it changes the opportunities. Um, you know, if you could go to law school and not have to worry about a car payment, not have to worry about an apartment, where your food's money's going to come from, that's completely different than, hey, I'm, I made it to law school, but how are we going to pay tuition? 
And so uh, I think that that's the, the big thing. And you have to earn it yourself. So I, my parents did well, but I left home at 17 after I graduated from high school. And I paid for my own college through scholarship and working as well as law school. So, you know, between 17 and 52, I've only gotten $450 from my father. What I did get is a good plan, great advice, a good name and a great education. And, the, you know, but you, your generation, don't just look at it, the jobs, you know, look at the opportunity. If you're working on a case, and you think that this is an interesting case dealing with business, look at a way to invest in the business. Uh, uh, look at a way, that's how I made my first. I was looking at something and I'm like, well, wait a minute, can I buy, you know, I can't buy this, but can I buy something that supplies this? Can I invest in that? And that took off. Um, you know, I, you know, I, real estate company, can I, I could just rent or buy a house but I got this, oh, let me buy the company that sells the houses and let me, let's build, you know, let's, let's get a rental portfolio up. So I would recommend that if you're going, it could be as simple as having your own firm. It could be as simple as, okay, you own your own firm now, now buy the building your firm is in. Um, that'd be the biggest thing. Make sure whatever it is that you have, uh, you get as much ownership in it as you can. And nowadays you don't have to wait. Uh, you can look around and you can still be an attorney like my dad was a dentist, but you can, you know, invest in other areas. So um, that's what saved me, you know, otherwise, I don't know what I'd do if I had to practice law. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, so I, that, that would be my advice. I think that was one of your questions. What was the second question? Uh, well, so the advice was the previous question, but the, these last two was just what was anything important about your job that you would like us to know? And your closing thoughts? My closing thoughts was I don't have a job. I haven't had a job in 20 years. I own whatever I go into, I own. So when I go to my company, like I just left, it's not a job. I'm, I own it. You know, and it's hard to, I keep enunciating that because it's, it's different from, oh, I'm a manager here, I'm this. Um, and, I, and when you own multiple businesses, I'm not just going one place, so I don't define it just, you know, people say, oh, you're a guy who owns a real estate. Like, no, that's just one business. There's this business, this other business. Um, so I just view myself as a businessman um, who has a law degree, which means I might be a little smart. Um, and so I think that has really helped me viewing every opportunity. Even when I was working for someone else, I wondered what it would be like to own. And I would talk to people who are much older than me about who were the owners. So my mentor, Becker and Polykoff, was Alan Becker. They owned their building. I've had conversations then about, well, you know, we just built this building. When you get your business, Jason, you're going to want to own the building. Well, I knew that from my father, but it was nice to talk to someone else. Um, and the reason he chose me and, and mentored me, and I still call him to this day, is he saw that business discussion. He goes, Jason, I got 200, you know, attorneys. What I need is more business people who can develop the business. And so everything's a business, regardless of what the business is. Law is a business. Understand the business side of that. And I think that'll make the entire difference. And then lastly, uh, I'll leave you with this, which is, if I recall correctly, Deuteronomy 1, 8. Remember the Lord our God, for it is he who gives us the ability to create wealth. Um, you know, all of this comes from somewhere. You didn't create it yourself. So it helps keep your head. And then the other thing is, the most important thing you can do is, if you have, regardless of what you have, the poor man who takes care of his children is far richer than the rich man who doesn't. So our community, what we can best do is be great parents. You know, law isn't worth giving up your family life for. Business isn't worth giving up your family life for. Make time to have a balanced life and, you know, make sure your children are, you're there for your children. Cool. 
Well, thank you. Thank you. Hey, am I getting paid for this? <laughs> Not by me. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I'll send a, I'll send a bill down. Um, <laughs> no, this has been a great opportunity. I, you know, I, I appreciate it because it's made me think about things I haven't uh, thought about, you know, as it relates to my parents and my grandparents. And I also appreciate like that. And this, this will provide, you know, something for them, for them to look at. Right. So, and if you're ever in DC, you have my number. Look me up. 